All right, good evening. Good to see everybody. Please turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 10. As we begin our study of God's Word, one of the four parts of our spiritual growth process to worship God, study His Word, love one another, and reach the lost. This is the second class in this quarter, and so on Sunday I introduced kind of what we're going to be studying for the next six months. And we're going to be studying the United Kingdom. And then we kind of began looking at Saul and how he was chosen to be king. And he was anointed privately by Samuel. And so we're going to continue the beginning of Saul's reign today as we, uh, as we talk about his, his public uh, anointing and uh, his first major battle. So before we jump into that, why don't we start with a a word of prayer. Our Father in God, we thank you so much for this day, and we thank you for your grace and your mercy, and we thank you for each other. And I'm so thankful for all that are here and for everyone in this church. I'm, I'm grateful for the relationships here and thankful, Father, for the love that is expressed here to me personally. And we are all thankful for these relationships. We pray that you will strengthen us, Father, and pray that you will, in this hour, help us to grow in our knowledge of your word. And through your son we pray, amen. All right, so we're going to begin here in chapter 10, reading verses 17 through 19. Thereafter, Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah. And he said to the sons of Israel, let me stop here and go ahead and put Mizpah up on the map so you see where that is. It's a little north of Gibeah. Now, Gibeah is Saul's hometown. And so it's just a little north of there. And that's just a little north uh, of Jerusalem. And verse 18, and he said to the sons of Israel, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, "I I brought Israel up from Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the power of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you, but you have today rejected your God, who delivers you from all your calamities and your distresses, yet you have said no, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. And so, God delivered you, and look how you responded to Him. He was good to you, and, and you have you've rejected God. And He's going to talk more about that later. And so, the tribe of Benjamin is chosen, and the family, anybody know or remember the family that is chosen? All right, it is Kish's family, but the name that is mentioned here is, is the family of Matrite, Okay. Or, or Matri, depending on your version. And then the individual is chosen, and he is Saul. All right? And where is he? He can't be found, so they inquire of the Lord, and what does the Lord say? Where is he? Hiding. He's hiding among the equipment. It's a humorous picture to me that, you know, here's this, this great big guy. He's head and shoulders taller than everybody, and and he's supposed to be their king. And he's literally hiding among the baggage. Why was he hiding? Shy. Okay, I think there may be several reasons. Any other thoughts? Afraid. afraid. Why would he be afraid? Sometimes deep down we know who we are. He's appointed king, but... We, we're going we're gonna to read later uh, that even after he's appointed king, he's still just doing farming work. Like, this is not somebody that has the background to be a king. He's, I think he knows that he, he doesn't really have any experience here. He's not really ready for this. Maybe he's also afraid of people who might turn against him, who might not support him. And uh, he... I think Brian made a very insightful comment last time that these, there are several indications, and this is one of them, that Saul is a very insecure man. There's humility there, but there's also a lot of insecurity. It's literally hiding. (laughs) So they have to bring him out 
and present him before the people. And Samuel tells the people the rules, God's rules concerning kings. And then we read in chapter 10 and verse 27. Uh, and this is in the context that there were some who decided that they would rally themselves behind Saul and support him. And, and I love it in verse 26. It says, uh, valiant men whose hearts God had touched. I just love that. But verse 27 says, but certain worthless men said, how can this one deliver us? And they despised him and did not bring him any present, but he kept silent. He kept silent. Now we look at that as wisdom and it may have just been fear. It may have been that he doesn't yet have enough support to really lay down a heavy hand. Um, but at least at this point, there's the appearance of wisdom. Uh, Lydon sends out a, a text a day to several people. I see you looking up, Lydon, and it's, it's much appreciated. And his text today was from Proverbs 7, 20, 17 and verse 28 that basically says, even a fool is regarded as wise when he keeps his mouth shut. And we're going to see that Saul is, he's foolish. He's not behaving foolish yet, but he's, he's got the appearance of wisdom here. He's, he's restraining himself. No, we're not, I'm, I'm not going to say anything about those who are uh, talking trash and saying they don't want to support me. And that in itself is a good thing. We, we as Christians need to kind of take it on the chin. Jesus taught, if your enemy you know, slaps you on one cheek, turn to him the other also, and, and so forth. And we live in a world, we live in a society that's all about our rights. And we're not going to let anybody take advantage of us. Well, you know, sometimes being a Christian means you let somebody take advantage of you. I'm not saying you just need to become... A, a doormat and let everybody walk all over you, but there are times that it's okay. Let them, let them talk that way. We're mature enough. We, we don't have to respond to everything. We don't have to, you know, take vengeance and so forth, right? Now, before we go into chapter 11, does anybody have any comments or uh, questions up to this point? Chloe? Okay. Debbie? Maybe it's an amount of fear, but also like an amount of um, kind of pushing that fear away and trying to show that he's he can be king. I feel like he tries to put on a show. Like Saul tries yeah. to prove to everybody he's a king and right. he can be a king when he doesn't have the background, like you said. But some of the time, I think there is a great lesson to learn that. He even, even though you should try to be the best version and you should be, in this case, Saul should have been mm -hmm. a king, there's also a great hu humility and humbleness in mm -hmm. saying to yourself, it's okay, I'm not perfect, I just need to work on it. Yeah. So it's just interesting how he just puts on a show and doesn't, he doesn't really, Saul never really admits his faults, it feels like to me. He's a, he's a pretty empty person, sadly. And look at, look, look at the the striking difference, the contrast of how hesitant he is to take on power now, but later how desperately he hangs on to power. Yeah. And he doesn't want anybody to threaten that power. Uh, he's just a very imbalanced, immature man. Um, absolutely. But he does start off here with the appearance of humility and, and wisdom. Uh, I think Debbie had her hand up, and then and Brian? I was just going to say, the people at the end that were speaking against him, it's also still showing their lack of faith. God, this is who God chose. He gave them a king, and they're still, and they're still not supportive of him. Some of them, right. Yeah. And the scripture, you know, doesn't put them in positive light. It calls them worthless men. Yeah, and that does show their, uh, well, <laughs> their worthlessness. Very good. Brian? Same point I was going to make. Okay. All right. Very good. Carol and Dave? No, no, Carol, and then Dave. Okay. Ladies first, always. <laughs> the, the passage that you just read um, has two, two things that come to mind. First, Saul is creating a standing army, and this is the first time in Israel's history that they're going to have a standing army, and it's just what God has foretold, that he's going to snap up all your people, and he's going mm. to take them as his servants. Yeah. 
the other thing is that he's going around snapping up all the valiant and strong men, which just proves that he is putting his trust not in God, but in the strength of men. Okay, okay, I think that's uh, that's a good point. All right, Dave, and then we need to move forward. You just got to remember, Saul didn't ask for this. This is true. He wasn't pursuing uh, this this position as as king. And, true. You know, you got a country boy, and somebody comes up to you and say, "Hey, you're going to be king." I'm going to be what? Right. You know, and and there was no history. Of, there's nothing for him to refer to. Right. In his own life. It's just his family. He didn't know how to be king any more than they knew how to be subjects. Exactly. And you know, he, was, and he goes back out and and, and farms. You know? yeah. I wish we knew more about his thoughts after that. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you, what do you think about it when all of a sudden you've been made king, then you go back to the farm and you're out there working in the fields? And, right. You know, trying to take all this in. Yeah. Yeah, and so that can help us have a little compassion with him in the sense that uh, he didn't ask for this, right? Uh, okay. All right, as we go into chapter 11, verses 1 through 13, Saul leads Israel to victory. And uh, this is all very positive. Now, I want to show you this new map we're going to be looking at in, in this quarter. This is uh, Israel in the days of King Saul. And see all this? It's supposed to be yellow, but it looks like mustard color or something. This is the area where Israel actually controls in the days when Saul becomes king. Contrast that with the map that we've been looking at. All this area was what God gave them. This is the tribe, these are the tribal areas. This is what land they did possess. But how the enemies have encroached upon the land on all sides, and it's just squeezing it in. So that's a sad reality of what has happened during the time of the judges. Now we've got the Ammonites here that are going to be trying to press their way north into this area where Ramoth Gilead is. And so that's the focus of this battle is the Ammonites who are coming to attack Jabesh Gilead. And who's the king? Nahash. Nahash. And boy, He's, he's just so arrogant. And he comes out, and he's got his army and everything, and oh, the people are just scared out of their minds. It just shows just how weak the people have become and, and the nation has become during the time of the judges that you know God had commanded them to just wipe out these, these wicked people, these, these nations. And now they're just at a point where if somebody comes out to attack them, they just kind of go out there and say, oh, please, please don't hurt us. Uh, we'll do anything. We'll be your sir. We'll, we'll make a, a treaty with you. What, what are your conditions? And what does Nahash say? What, are the condition, what is the condition he says? Pluck out everybody's right eye. Hmm. Well, uh, can you give us seven days so we can find somebody to deliver us? And if we can't find anybody, we'll come and... We'll submit ourselves to you. Now that in itself is a little bizarre. Uh, that you got this guy coming out, and you're going to say, uh, "Can we just have a week to find like somebody that'll deliver us?" And he he lets them do it. I, I think that may be his pride. Like people aren't going to find anybody. Okay, you want seven days to find a leader? Go for it. <laughs> and so they've got seven days, and uh, they're they're going to. Uh, they're going to go find a, a king for themselves. They're going to get this man to come and deliver them. Well, this message that Nahash was coming to attack Jabesh Gilead and threatening to put out their eyes and everything was brought all the way down to Gibeah, which is where Saul was. And it wasn't that they were sending this message down to their king. At this point, the nation hasn't rallied around their king. You had this element that as we saw before, that wasn't supportive of Saul. And I mean, this, you know, this is their first king, and so he's not even, they, the king doesn't even know how to act like a king. There's no like regular kingship model here for him to, to follow in their history. He just goes back to farming. And so the message comes, and, and everybody's weeping. Oh, it's terrible. You know, it's just the, 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 the Ammonites, and they're going to attack, and it's awful, and people are going to die. And, 
And he hears it. It's not that they were like, save us, king. He just hears it. He's behind, he's behind the oxen. He hears about this, and he gets mad. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. He, he becomes righteously angry and uh, rallies the troops, and there end up being 330,000 that, that are in the army. And, you know, in the days of the Exodus and of the wandering in the wilderness, about how many did we have in the army? You had 600,000. So this is about half, right? Maybe a little bit more than half uh, that, are, that are here to battle, which kind of shows the, the state of decline in the, in the period of the judges itself. And rallies them in the city of Bezek. All right? And if, as you notice, that is just across from Jabesh Gilead on the other side of the Jordan. Mm-hmm. So they've, they've gathered there. And that's why it's helpful to use a map. Otherwise, it's just Bezek. Well, where is that? What does that mean? I don't know. But if you look at a map, you go, oh, cool. Okay, it's right there across from Jabesh Gilead. Makes perfect sense, right? So it helps it all to fit together. So he has a message sent to Jabesh Gilead. And what is the message? (coughs) Deliverance is coming. When, When does he say deliverance is coming? Tomorrow. So they go to, to the king of Ammon, and what do they tell him? We couldn't find anybody. So tomorrow we'll bring ourselves out to submit to you. Why did they say that? So they would come yeah. out. So they wouldn't be expecting a battle, right? They're not prepared. They're just, oh, okay, everybody let your guards down. There's not going to be any resistance here. And that's what they're expecting. But the next day... It was, it was just, it was a slaughter. It was ugly. And total victory. And we read in verses 12 and 13 of chapter 11, Then the people said to Samuel, Who is he that said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring them in that we may put them to death. Now, you got you to gotta realize they're probably going overboard, but it does show that everybody's supportive now. Right? There's this zeal to support the king and, And verse 13, but Saul said, not a man shall be put to death this day. For today the Lord has accomplished deliverance in Israel. That is a wise statement. That is a wise statement. It wasn't a day to put these men to death. I don't think. I think this was wise. I think this showed a level of compassion and wisdom. And notice he doesn't say, because I've accomplished deliverance. What does he say? the Lord. I do think that there is potential in Saul. There is potential. If he had continued this sort of an attitude, he could have just been a great king. But he starts well, but he doesn't finish well. So many Christians start well. And they don't finish well. So many. It's so sad in my years of teaching people the gospel. But anyway, that's kind of beside the point. But we need to start well, but we also need to finish well. All right, any thoughts or comments before we move along to the next section? All right, Randy and then Chloe. I think it's interesting. When they sent, you know, the message, I just went to the people trying to find people, not to the king. I I think it kind of backs up the fact that they didn't know what they were asking for when they asked for the king. Because when they got one, they didn't know what to do with it. (laughs) That's true. Kind of goes to what Dave was saying a second ago. Well, how's my age No, that's 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 great. Good point, Chloe. Um, so, could it be considered deceitful and like a lie that they sent the message to the king and like have a, and that the king took it as a the king of Jabesh Gilead took it as like a sign to like lower. Oh, sure. The yeah, that was deceitful. Yeah, that was absolutely deceitful. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts, comments, Brian? Um, I don't. I don't know if I want to be so strong as to call this a direct foreshadowing, but I do find it interesting. Verses 12 and 13, when you, when you compare that to Jesus, you know, God could have said, who was it that said my son was not king and, and was not supportive of him and actually killed him? I'm going to kill them all. And instead, he said, you know, 
I'm, I'm accomplishing a great deliverance. This isn't a time to slaughter those who are against my king. Mm. This is a time to rejoice in salvation. So yeah. I just think it's an interesting parallel. Well, it is true. We have a compassionate king in King Jesus. Amen. All right. So let's move on now. Verses, well, starting in verse 14. We have this new section, Saul and his people uh, renew, renew the kingdom. So Samuel calls the people to meet at what city? Gilgal. Gilgal. Now, Gilgal was important. That was the place where, in the time of the, um, well, toward the end of the wandering, right? When they crossed over the Jordan, they first crossed the Jordan, they went to Gilgal. That's where they set up the monument of the 12 stones. That's where the men were circumcised and the 40th Passover was eaten and the manna ceased and all of that. Gilgal was very, very important. And so there may be some historical significance to the fact that Samuel says, let's go to Gilgal to basically rejoice. I mean, he's already been made king privately. He's been anointed publicly. But people weren't behind him. Now everybody's rallied behind him and we're just going to go and we are going to rejoice about this and uh, they do they they uh, offer peace offerings what when you're offering peace offerings what are you say, where are you communicating what's the point of a peace offering what's the communication and the message that 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 sends yeah we're we're right with god you know things are great and uh, samuel publicly resigns as their leader and he says to them, here's your king. I'm old. I'm, I'm done as a, a leader among you. But then read verse 3 of chapter 12. I think this is significant. Here I am. Bear witness against me before the Lord and his anointed. Okay, so you see that term. His anointed refers to the king. And of course, as I've talked about last time, Messiah means anointed. Christ means anointed. Christ is Greek. Messiah is Hebrew. But they're the same. They're the equivalent uh, meaning. It is anointed. And so that would refer to the king. Okay, so when we say Christ Jesus, you know what we're saying? We're saying King Jesus. Right? We call Jesus the Messiah. We're calling him Jesus the king. Okay, but anyway, going back to Saul here. Verse, uh, continuing in verse 3, Samuel says, Whose ox have I taken, or whose donkey have I taken, or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed, or from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? I will restore it to you. They said, You have not defrauded us, or oppressed us, or taken anything from any man's hand. He said to them, The Lord is witness against you, and is anointed, is witness this day that you have found nothing in my hand. They said, he is witness. Now, don't you think it's pretty marvelous that Samuel has been, has been serving the people as their leader, as their priest, as their prophet for years. He's been involved in the work really of, of, of at least started his training when he was a boy. So his whole life has been dedicated to this. And he could, here's a man that after a full life of serving these people could say, have I done any of you wrong? And they all said, you've done none of us wrong. What does that say about Samuel? He's blameless. He had a blameless character. I think there might be very few of us that could say that to everybody we've ever known. Have I done you wrong? And everybody say, no, you've not done me wrong. Could we say that in the workplace? Right? Have I, have I done anybody here wrong? If everybody say, no, you've not done me wrong. Could we say that, you know, at school? Or could we say that in our homes, in our families? I know I couldn't. I get a whole bunch of responses saying, yeah, you did me wrong here and here and here and there and the other. Um, we, we all have this goal to be blameless, to be blameless. Uh, this passage in the New Testament, Philippians, says, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Children of God, look at this, above reproach. Samuel was above reproach. 
in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. This, uh, this idea of blamelessness is a qualification for shepherds, for elders, isn't it? And some versions render it blameless. Some of them render it above reproach. So it's such an important quality uh, for us, you know, characteristic for us to pursue. And it was one that Samuel had. And, and not only did he say, have I done you wrong? And they said, no, but he, he adds to when he says, have I done you wrong? What does he say there at the end? If I have done you wrong, what? I'll fix it. I'll fix it. Isn't that beautiful? So that needs to be our attitude. To, you know, if I have done somebody wrong, I'm not going to sweep it under the rug. I'm not going to ignore it. I'm not going to tell them it's your problem. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to do in my power uh, whatever I can to, to, to fix that. Right? So that's, that's powerful, I think. We'll kind of back to our slide here. So Samuel then uh, reviews Israel's history. But he doesn't go through before the flood, the flood, the scattering of the people, the patriarchs, the exodus, the wandering in the wilderness, invasion and conquest, judges, united kingdom. He, he doesn't do that. He only uh, highlights two periods. He highlights the exodus and he highlights the judges. Why? What do those two Bible periods have in common? Think about it for a minute. The exodus and the period of the judges. Deliverance. 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 And this is going to come back later in, in his speech. He's, he's priming the pump for, look at what God has done for you. And it, earlier he talked about the Exodus. When, you, when, when Jacob was in Egypt, Moses and Aaron, under the power of God, led the people out. They delivered you from that oppression. In the time of the judges, God used the judges to deliver you from your oppression. Okay, so he's, he's priming the pump for look, look what you've done to God after what he's done to you. He says, make sure you and, and your king. Now, did I read verse 13 yet? Let me make sure. Uh, no, no I'm, okay, I'm not there yet. That's right. So I'm getting ahead of myself. Now let's read verses 12 and 13. Uh, when you saw that Nahash, the son of Ammon, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us although the Lord God was your king. Now let's just stop and take this verse in for a second. This gives us some background for their initial request. It wasn't just that they had went to Samuel and, and were thinking, oh, I'm just so tired of judges. You know, look at these nations. I want to be like the nations. That was part of it. But there was this specific threat that was spurring them to make their request. And what was the specific threat? It was the king of Ammon, right? It was the Ammonites. It was Nahash. And so when they came, and we didn't know that originally when they made that request, when they came to Samuel asking, give us a king, they had this as a part of their motive. They're, they're being threatened right now by a powerful king. If you want to fight a king, what do you got to have? got to have a king. And what Samuel says is, you already had a king. Who was their king? God was your king. You had a king. You don't need some human. The human's not going to be better than God. <laughs> the Lord your God was your king. And the Lord our God is our king. Verse 13, now therefore here is the king. Now look at this. Whom you have chosen. And I, I don't know if there was finger pointing going on, but, you know, I imagine there might have been. This, uh, here is the king whom you have chosen, whom you have asked for. And behold, the Lord has set a king over you. Now, it is true that, in a sense, as Samuel said back in chapter 10, we didn't read the verse, but uh, that the Lord chose Saul. But here he says, you have chosen him. So how can both the Lord choose him and the people choose him? What, what's the answer there? The people wanted one. The people wanted one. Okay. Okay, the king they deserved. Yeah, and he's going to prove to be very foolish. 
I think the answer is God gave them a king in the sense that he let them pick what they wanted. But have, make, 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 have no doubts. What am I trying to say? Saul is the one they chose. Why did they choose Saul? Because they didn't choose God. All right, because they rejected God. But what was it about Saul? Michael Posey. Yes, sir. And handsome and tall and he just looked the part and all of that. Did they pick him because he was of the right tribe? No. no. What did Jacob prophesy in Genesis 50? The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. So the, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. What tribe was Saul from? Benjamin. Benjamin. If the Lord had chosen Saul, would he have chosen... Well, let me say, if the Lord had chosen the king, would he have chosen somebody that was of the wrong tribe? Would that make sense? So just that alone shows this was the people's choice. The people's choice. And they're going to get what they asked for, sadly. Sadly. So then Samuel says, you make sure that, that you all obey God. And make sure that your, your king obeys God. And he says, here's what I'm going to do. I want to make you aware of the fact that you have sinned. You have sinned in asking for this king. And what did he say he was going to do to get their attention? To bring fear into them. He's going to bring thunder and rain during the wheat harvest, which is about May or June. During the wheat harvest, it didn't rain much. They didn't want it to rain much. I don't do a lot of, like, you know, garden-type stuff or any of this kind of stuff. I'm, this is not me, so I don't know. But I read that if the grain gets wet during the harvest, what will happen to it? It will mildew. And so by sending the rain on this harvest, it would be a punishment on the people. It would destroy their harvest. I think that's part of what's going on here. But is thunder itself kind of frightening? Does it make you like it makes me just think of God and His power? And it kind of humbles you? I think that's an element of what's going on here. As well as the fact that it doesn't normally rain. And if, if Sam, in this time of the year, and if Samuel can say, hey, it's going to start raining, and they're looking around, it's not like there's some great big storm cloud probably, you know? And then it does happen as he said. What would that tell the people? This is from God. And, and it would bring them to respect Samuel as well. So all of that's kind of going on here. And when the thunder and rain come, the people are moved with great fear. And they recognize their sinfulness. And we read in verse 19, Then all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God, so that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil by asking for ourselves a king. I love, I love to just relish these moments when the Israelites do a good job. Good job. That is exactly what you should have said. I hate that it took the thunder and the rain and and all this drama to get them to really admit that. Is that sometimes what it takes for us? Sometimes it takes some physical calamity or some bad thing happening for us to, uh, to finally confess our sins and to recognize what's going on. But at least for this moment, this, this is a very good confession. And Samuel's response is telling. Samuel said to the people, do not fear. You have committed all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Notice he doesn't say, oh, don't worry, you didn't really do anything wrong. No, he says, you did, you, you messed up big time, but just keep following the Lord. Verse, and notice he says, serve the Lord with what? At the end of verse 20. Verse 20. With all your heart. With all your heart. 
And that brings us back to Deuteronomy 6. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. Verse 21, uh, you must not turn aside. For then you would go after futile things which cannot profit or deliver. Oh, you mean things like an earthly king? Yeah, things like that. Because they are futile. For the Lord will not abandon His people on account of His great name because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for Himself. He's saying the Lord will be true. The Lord will be there. And it's not because you're some great deserving people, but it's because the Lord uh, has taken pleasure to make you His people. And He will do it on account of what? His great name. Verse 23, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. But I will instruct you in the good and right way. Look at that. Here these people have messed up royally. They've actually rejected Samuel too in all of this. He's been personally insulted here in their rejection of him and everything. And he's saying, I'm not going to stop praying for you. And I'm not going to stop trying to help you and to teach you God's Word. Thank you, Brian. We only got four minutes because that was a little late. And I love what he says here. He says, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by doing what? By ceasing to pray for you. Can it become sinful? Can it reach a point where just not praying as we should can become sinful? I think absolutely. Now, it was especially incumbent upon Samuel as the prophet and the leader, uh, even though he was stepping down. But we, we have to realize that sin doesn't only happen when we actively commit things. There's sin of commission and sin of omission. Sin of commission are sins we're guilty of by committing things we should have done. Sin of omission are sins we're guilty of simply by not doing what we should. And I do believe that even refusing to pray as we ought, neglecting that duty, that can become sinful because we're expected to do that, right? Verse 24, only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart. Look at that again. He's saying, I'm not just telling you go through the motions and offer sacrifices and say the right words to God when you've sinned. I'm telling you, I, I want you to serve the Lord with all the gusto you have. For consider what great things He has done for you. Oh, you mean like delivered us out of Egypt? Yeah, things like that. Oh, you mean like delivered us from all of our enemies in the days of the judges? Yes, things like that. Oh, you mean like delivered us from Nahash, the king of Ammon? Yes, things like that. It's the law of reciprocity. If someone does kind things to you, what do you naturally want to do? You want to do kind things to them. It should be the same way with God. And who has done more kind things for us than, than God and His Son, our King, Jesus the Christ? No one. No one. And so be motivated not by guilt to serve the Lord, but by the fact, look at what He's done for me. Look at how He has blessed me. I want to serve Him with all my heart. Verse 25, But if you still do wickedly, both you and your king will be swept away. It kind of ends on a negative note. <laughs> um, there was great potential for good here. Even though they had messed up royally. No pun intended. They had messed up big time. They, they could make things right from here on. Saul could have done a good job from here on if they had chosen to serve the Lord. And so it comes down to choice, doesn't it? Maybe you've messed up royally. Maybe, I mean, we all have messed up. But maybe you're just really, you know, saying, I've just messed up so bad. Don't let that make you keep giving up. Let that motivate you to do better. Because from this point, regardless of what you've ever done, what, what any of us have ever done, whatever has happened to us in the past or what sin we've committed, from here forward, it's up to us to make things right and to serve the Lord with all our heart. We can do that. Fifteen seconds for comments. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't leave much time. All right, thanks, everybody.
for uh, your kind attention. Please read through page 15 for uh, the next class. And I will be, Brian and I are switching um, duties, so he's preaching again on Sunday. And by my request, it's a sermon I really wanted him to do instead of me. I think he'll do a better job with it. And I'm going to be teaching class on Sunday. 